During the first decades of the 15th century, after the wars with the German order had ended, Lithuania turned from the influence of Eastern culture towards the West. The state, the residents of which were over half Orthodox, was rapidly Latinized. A great number of Byzantine Orthodox churches were built not only in the Russian lands controlled by Lithuania, but also in Vilnius. The ruling Gediminians strengthened the position of the Roman Catholic Church, attempting to remove Orthodox believers from the strengthening influence of Moscow. They themselves supported and encouraged the nobility to support Catholic churches and establish parishes and monasteries not only in the ethnic lands, but also in the eastern Lithuanian territories inhabited by Slavs. Along with the spread of Catholicism, Gothic style was also rapidly taking root. Alongside defensive entrenchments, castles and other buildings used for military purposes built within the large territory of the state, more beautiful and more luxurious palaces, meant to show the state to the world, also began to be built. The biggest blossoming of Gothic-style architecture and artistic creation in general is associated with the name of Alexandras Yogolaitis. The capital was enclosed within a stone wall, the Palace of Grand Dukes was rebuilt and the fine complex of the Bernardine Monastery was erected. At that time, artistic creation had not yet become a separate and independent field of human activity, so it covered different areas of everyday life. Artistic creativity had a lot to do with wealth. The more expensive the work was, the more ingenuity and subtlety could be seen. The most luxurious and at the same time the most artistic buildings of that time were devoted to God. Cathedrals, parish temples and monastery churches or chapels and everything that was necessary for furnishing them are among such buildings. The Gothic style is a very unified style. Maybe that is because in the consciousness of the people of that time, all visible and spiritual creations were in harmony in one undivided world. Wall painting, altar paintings and sculptures, liturgical dishes and other furnishing elements combined into one undivided whole, a symbolic model of the world. The same motifs, symbols and ornaments were repeated in architectural forms and different artistic works. It was as if everything was ascending and cyclical and was saturated with the idea of eternity. Comparing such disparate items as a stone church and a fragile openwork monstrous made by a goldsmith, we see the same silhouette of sharp spires soaring upwards. The religious worldview flowed through the content of both church and secular pieces of art. Books of the Holy Scriptures, apocryphal gospels and the lives of saints were the main sources of themes and images for the works of art from the Gothic period. People liked using images of saints and stylized plant ornaments not only to decorate liturgical dishes and clothes, but also to decorate other different works of art used in everyday life, as well as decorative ceramic wall tiles and special glazed tiles. The largest number of surviving Gothic elements from the realm of interior decoration is made up of special glazed tiles. In Gothic creation it was common to use different methods, including engravings, drawings, molds and similar things. On the other hand, artistic practice was quite strongly regulated, although it would be wrong to say that the originality and uniqueness of works was not valued. Pieces of art that survive from those times surprise and fascinate us with bursts of imagination and creativity and with attentive observation of environment. For example, a painter who designed a string of flowers or tiny plants in the margins of a book quite often inserted a little bird, a human figure or some unearthly creature from the world of spirits and demons between them. Understanding the diversity of the world created by God and the wealth of its limitless forms encouraged artists to look for new ways to design and use source material. For this reason, despite general principles of construction and analogous decorative elements, we would not be able to find two Gothic-style churches that are exactly the same. The names of the artists of the Gothic era were buried in oblivion by history. Very few artists signed their work, and most documents of that time were destroyed by fires or during the chaos of war. Even Gothic buildings and works of art themselves survived only in fragments or were changed by later repairs. Stone construction was still expensive and required great amounts of time and experienced craftsmen. For this reason, even in cities, only the most important public buildings and houses of noblemen or rich city residents were built of brick. Grand Dukes, bishops, or the richest noblemen Radvilos, Gostote and Sapiegos funded and furnished the most prominent Gothic cathedrals. Churches not only attested to Lithuania's being part of the Christian world, but also expressed the power and wealth of the entire country. 
On the other hand, the size of the church, even the structure of its content and decorations, depended not only on the generosity of the founders, but also on the rank or function of the church itself. Cathedrals, most important churches of city parishes or monastery complexes funded by the rulers, were distinguished by the complexity of architectural solutions. More modest and simpler churches were built in smaller towns and estates. The brick Gothic style spread in Lithuania, and architectural solutions determined primarily by this construction technique, such as simple rectangular plans, separation of flat walls into pointy arched portals, stair-like buttresses and unique windows and niches, were present and kept improving. Profile bricks became the main element of exterior decoration. The edges of windows and portals, the lines of friezes and decorative arches and niches were built from them, and black, overfired bricks were used for constructing simple but decorative geometric ornaments. Tall pillars and complicated, ornate, net-like or crystal arches, which are a sign of masterful bricklayers, brought splendor to interiors. Orthodox architecture adopted some stone architectural features of Gothic churches. Orthodox churches similar to Catholic ones were built, and many similar decorative elements or forms of construction were used. Some other areas of artistic creativity were also influenced in a similar way. During the prosperous period of the Gothic style in Lithuania, many liturgical items, sculptures, paintings, illustrated manuscripts and incunabula, as well as luxurious glass or metal dishes, were brought from Western European countries. However, quite a large number of them were also created in Lithuania itself. Goldsmiths, who worked in Lithuania, were especially skillful. In a goldsmith's guild, established in Vilnius in 1495, the goldsmiths mostly came from the German lands or received training there. They adopted the technology and style of the German goldsmith art, which dominated all over Central Europe at that time. On the other hand, iconic traditions survived for a long time in sacramental painting. Such a combination of Western Gothic style and Byzantine Orthodox artistic tradition became an exclusive feature of Lithuanian artistic culture of the time, which in its own way reflected the constant efforts of Lithuanian rulers to establish a politically important church union. The Gothic style, which marked the end of the Middle Ages in Europe, became the first Christian culture style in the Grand Duchy of Lithuania. Here it experienced some transformations related with general development of public life and the strong influence of Byzantine culture. However, in some areas of artistic creativity, especially in architecture and the art of the goldsmiths, the influence of the Gothic style remained for a remarkably long time, for as long as until the 17th century. It existed in parallel with the influence of the Italian and Dutch Renaissance styles and mannerism, which appeared as early as at the end of the 16th century.